Well, hey, good morning, church. It's so good to be with you. As Justin mentioned in the intro, we're all just kind of in studio, just kind of processing this moment, reminiscing a little bit. So this is our last time of kind of live streaming or preaching, you know, live online. But so looking forward to gathering again next Sunday. I have no idea really what that's going to look like. Hope that I'll still be know how to preach to a gathered congregation. Had a little feeler for that a couple of weeks ago in the evening watch party, preached live, and it was just so much much fun for me, hopefully for the guys there as well. So, so we're really looking forward to next week, uh, but they've come, this little space has become uh, just quite a holy little sanctuary for us. We've really enjoyed having this opportunity. So next week we get to gather again. Next week we get to practice a lot of one another ring. So as I've been thinking through this through this series, uh, there's just so many of these one another's that as as amazing we've, as we've been able to be united online in this time, as amazing as that as that has been, there's just some things, especially these one another's. This is kind of hard to do without being in person. So for example, a, re, a oft repeated one another phrase: "Greet one another." You go, I can greet one another, kind of. Online, you can, except in the Bible, whenever it says greet one another, it's five times, it says with a holy kiss. So you can't do that online, although we will not be able to do that next week either due to social distancing and other uh, obvious reasons. Uh, how about serve one another? Just really hard to, to do that without being with people. Pray for one another. I've just been amazed at how we have been able to pray together in this time, especially our Wednesday, first Wednesdays, uh, sorry, last Wednesday of the month. Prayer meetings have been such a highlight for us. We just look forward to being able to be with people and pray with people, fellowship with one another. Uh, there's just going to be a different level of fellowship when we gathered together. And then what perhaps what I'm looking forward to the most Next week is this one. Teach and admonish each other. Teach and, ad and admonish one another. Singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And I just cannot wait for us to be next week singing together and hearing the voices. But for today, let's talk about perhaps, not perhaps, the most fundamental one another statement. This one another statement governs our most basic conduct as a Christian, whether that is to those outside of the faith or those inside of the faith. This is our most basic guiding principle as Christians. And that is to, I'm pretty sure you're going to be able to guess it, to love one another. So it should not come as a surprise to you that this one another statement to love one another is by far the most repeated one another statement in the Bible. And I want to have a look at its occurrence this morning in Romans chapter 12. So turn with me or tap with me to Romans chapter 12. We're going to read from uh, verses 9 through to verse 18. Just while you're getting there, one of the reasons I picked this from about 15 or 20 one another statements in the New Testament is because it includes two other one another statements that we're going to look at today. So it'll kind of be three in one. And verse 5 of Romans 12 also mentions a one another statement. So Romans 12 just packed with one another's, which makes sense if you were paying attention in week one, because Romans 1 to 11 is all about my relationship with God, but that then automatically leads to this relationship with others. So Romans 12 is just loaded with one another statements. So let's have a look in Romans 12, see if you can pick up those one another statements. So verse 9 it says this, let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. 
Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And if possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Now, if you've been around church for a little while, then you're probably aware that when the Bible uses the word love in our New Testament, originally written in Greek, that there are four different Greek words for love. We only have the one word for love, and that one word we use to describe our feelings towards pizza and our moms at the same time. So Greek has four different words to describe the breadth of love. And so there is the, one of the words is the a word that describes self-sacrificial love, being willing to give your life up for someone, that kind of love, with agape love, which is obviously used of the love that God has for us in Jesus Christ. That's, that's the one form of love that comes up in the New Testament. The other form that comes up uh, is, is the kind of love, a rom the romantic side of love, and that is the Greek word eros, so that's probably pretty easy to remember that one. And then another word for love is storge, which is kind of the natural love that would come with family. So it's a family kind of love that would naturally be present in that kind of relationship. And then another kind of love, philos, which is a love, more like a love of friendship or camaraderie that, that comes after building some kind of relationship with somebody. So with that in mind, what would you guess to be the words for love used in Romans 12? So it come up, let love be genuine and then love one another with brotherly affection. What are your guesses there? Well, what's interesting is that three of those four uses are there. All of them except for the eros kind that is reserved for a different kind of relationship. The other three are there. A God pal of let love be genuine is that self-sacrificial love. Let your love that is willing to sacrifice for others, let that be genuine. That's amazing. And then there is love one another with brotherly affection. So obviously there's the family kind of love there, but what's really interesting is that it's tied together with the kind of friendship or more distant kind of love. And what that's saying is that Christians should love fellow Christians as though they were family to the point at which they're willing to sacrifice for each other. You have all three of those loves in this one short verse, which is kind of what I spoke about a little bit in week one, this idea that we as Christians are now in, our, in this community, we are now each other's family, which is absolutely unique to Christianity. It is unique that this word love, philos, and especially as it, as it appears here, which is Philadelphia, yeah, that's, that's that city. That is the city of brotherly love. That's the exact word that appears here. And it's always something. The word Philadelphia does not exist in, doesn't come up in any other writings of the time apart from in the Bible. It does not exist outside of Christianity. It's only in Christian community that you would see somebody who's not your physical family, but now they're part of your faith family, actually be seen and love them like you would your family. That is absolutely unique to Christianity. And the reason for that is because this kind of love that we have for one another as fellow Christians only happens as a result of being a Christian. It is not possible to love people who are not your family with a self-sacrificing love if you are not in this saved, committed relationship with Jesus. It only exists 
in our relationship with Jesus. And we're going to see why in a little bit. But let me just show you a verse that clearly connects the idea of being a Christian and how that leads to loving one another. Why it's unique to Christianity. Why it's connected to being a Christian. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 says this, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For because you have been born again, and not of this perishable seed, but of imperishable through this living and enduring word of God. Just sit back, just have a, have a look at that statement. It's clear that Peter expects that those who are saved or born again and those who are growing in holiness are loving one another. It's one of the reasons that I love this verse. Is if you're sitting there wondering, is it really a big deal for me as a Christian to practice this kind of love that seems just kind of a high bar and you're trying to wiggle out of this? Well, this verse, there's no wiggle room. You're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. Where the, where the rock on the one side is, because you are pursuing obedience, because you're becoming sanctified or holy, because you're growing as a Christian, you love. And then the hard place on the other side is, because you've been born again, you love one another sincerely from the heart with brotherly affection. Now, the reason that I'm emphasizing this how we made this connection in week one already of our relationship with God leads to relationship with each other. Now I'm saying that this kind of love that we experience from God, that we have from God now, should flow to others. It, it comes from that same kind of connection. The reason I'm emphasizing that is because sometimes I feel like, you know, as Christians, if you think back to the time when you became a Christian, maybe for some of you it was long ago, maybe for some of you it was... Uh, not so long ago, maybe some of you are kind of in that space at the moment. Well, the, the beauty of that moment when you become a Christian is you realize that when you commit your life to Christ and accept this gift of salvation, you realize His grace. I and mean, you realize at that moment that there is this tremendous possibility for change. It's like wide open possibilities. This is so much that you know that needs to change. So much that you want to change. There's so much that can change. And that's, the, that's the beauty of entering into this relationship with Christ is the possibility of transformation. But I feel like sometimes we see those opportunities for change as kind of like, this is maybe a little sacrilegious, but maybe we see it like this. You can even go to a car wash. And you pull up your car and there's like the list of options for the car wash. You can have this, the full package down at the bottom, the most expensive one. And there's like all these other packages. And sometimes it seems like in Christianity, in that moment of coming to Christ and realizing all of the options available to us, is like kind of we select the packages that we want. So like, man, I'll, I'll take the freedom from addiction package. Yes, please. Um, I would, I'll take the renewed sense of purpose. That sounds great. Spiritual gifts, miracles. Give me that one. That sounds super fun. But the willingness to self-sacrifice, serve, give up life for each other. That option, that's like, no one's buying that package. That one is free. They're not even charging that one because that's not just naturally what you would sign up for when you become a Christian. But see, what these verses are telling us is that that's <laughs> when you become a Christian, God says, right, here's where I'm going to get to work right away. And it's almost always in how we love one another. It is not an optional extra. It is immediately where God 
gets to work in our lives. Our ability to really love one another. Now I realize that that's a lot easier said than done. That in many ways this is a lifelong journey. And there are serious obstacles in our path to truly loving one another. And I can think of at least three obstacles that hinder us from experiencing and giving and being able to love one another like this. So I'm going to go through two of them pretty quickly and I'm going to linger on the third one. So the first obstacle in learning to love in truly loving our fellow Christians, our fellow congregation, our church members as family is, well, what I mentioned in week one, for some people that come from a difficult family background, this metaphor of brotherly affection isn't particularly attractive. That there are some people who come from homes that are broken, who have been hurt through their family, where families are known for fighting with each other and treating each other worse than they would treat anyone else in the world. And this may be a significant roadblock for you if you've never grown up experiencing this kind of Philadelphia, this brotherly love. You never experienced that love. You never learned how to love like this. You haven't experienced warmth and affection that should be experienced when Christians gather that hopefully we're going to see next week even through masks and weird awkward elbow bumps. Maybe you've never experienced that and so that seems difficult for you to comprehend. I'll never forget one of my first instances of coming face to face with Christian community that was truly loving. It was kind of this camp that I went to. I remember going there. There was just this sense of warmth and affection. And I just thought, this is weird. Like, this is some cult. Get me out of here. And by the end, you just realize just this is, this is brotherly affection from the heart that's sincere that should characterize Christian community. But for some people, it's really difficult if you've never experienced it and never learned how to give it. Which is why, in some ways, God has designed the church as a reparenting organism. Not just for your spiritual healing, but, I believe, for emotional healing for those who have not been loved, who have not been cared for, who have not experienced that warmth, to experience it and learn to give and care and to love. God has in some ways designed the church to be this reparenting organism for all of those who have never experienced that. And I'm mentioning this again today, I mentioned it in week one, is that I think it's so critical for us as a church in South Africa, especially. I mean, many of you will know the statistics, but in South Africa, our statistics of the number of single-headed households, some of the highest in the world. Back in 2015 census, the latest data we have, of those single-headed households, 50,000 homes headed by children, teenagers or younger. So our witness as a church in this context, in South Africa, this is going to be crucial to our mission that we become this reparenting organism, that we become this kind of community, that people can experience what they have never experienced and been given, be given the grace to learn how to love. They haven't seen it and experienced it and need to learn how to do that. So that's the first obstacle. This idea of family is difficult for some. It'll be a key part of our mission. Second obstacle to us truly loving others like this, this Philadelphia brotherly affection, is insecurity, our insecurities, and fear of rejection. So if you've lived on this earth 
for more than like a year, <laughs> you've experienced rejection. And since most of you listening have lived more than one year, you have, like me, accumulated a lifetime of hurts and rejections. You've loved, but that love has not been returned. You've ventured out to be vulnerable and open, and it has been ignored or worse, abused. And so you hold back from loving others, from being in this kind of relationship to protect yourself. Which is why in the Bible, every time before it gets to love one another and instructions to love one another, you are first reminded that you are loved by God. And you are loved deeply, fully by God. And you are loved unconditionally. Let me just repeat that, just remind you of this basic truth. Before the Bible gets, before you get to Romans 12, Romans 1 to 11, it's about God's amazing love for you. Whenever in the Bible it gets to 1 Peter, loving one another, your first reminder that you've been born again, you've been loved by God, you've been chosen. You've been set apart. Before the Bible gets to instructing us to love, it reminds us every time you are loved. And loved with a perfect love. What that means is the love of God is enough. It's all the love we actually need. By gift, it gives us so much more. And the love of spouse and the love of family and camaraderie and friendship and store game and all those other kinds of love. But the only love we truly, our hearts truly need it's the love of God. It's full, complete, perfect. He loves you like that. And He loves you like that unconditionally. Not dependent on being attractive or being good or being appealing. That kind of, that's the gospel. And when you get the gospel, when you really get it, when you know that you are fully and unconditionally loved, that should give you a sense of security, knowing that you are loved, that you are now able to love without fear of rejection because you are secure in the love that God has for you. Which is why this Christian love is impossible apart from Christ. This Philadelphia doesn't exist outside of Christianity because it's only in Christianity that you can know God loves you fully while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And that gives us all the security that we need to be able to venture out on this vulnerable journey of loving one another. So speaking on this, Tim Keller says this. So, so, so do you love to be loved? Or do you love because you are loved? It's such an incisive question. Do you love to be loved? What I mean, do you offer love in order to receive it? Most of us do. We're willing to venture out and love others with the hope of it being received. And then when it's not, we get hurt and then we stop loving. So do you love in order to be loved in return? Or do you love because you are loved? You know that you're loved. So when you get the gospel, you're free to love. But only then. Otherwise, you're love and always trying to take in return. Third obstacle, the one I really wanted to spend some time on this morning. To loving one another deeply, sincerely, with this brotherly affection, is our selfishness. 
And this is where things get a little bit hard. But I can say this, and you heard a little bit of this last week already. Nothing destroys the possibility of love existing. Nothing destroys that possibility more than selfishness. That applies in every context. In marriage, nothing will destroy the possibility of love existing than selfishness. In family context, in friendship context, in every kind of context, selfishness torpedoes love existing. And this is where we realize, man, we're really up against it here. If we're up against our selfishness, then now we've got, we got some work to do. Because this area of selfishness is the devil himself. I don't often speak about him. It is a reality. The devil himself operates in the sphere of our selfishness. I mean, Satan's very nature is selfish, consumed with self. So I love how John Milton, in his epic poem, Paradise Lost, he, he describes Satan like this, as a self-consumed, narcissistic being, a creature stuck inside the eternal prison of himself, speaks only of himself, obeys only himself, loves only himself, is focused only on himself. Sounds a little like some people, you know, maybe... Commenting on this, C.S. Lewis says, to admire Satan in Paradise Lost, this picture of him as this all-consuming narcissistic being, to admire Satan in Paradise Lost is to give one's vote not only for a world of misery, but also for a world of lies and propaganda, of wishful thinking, and get this, incessant autobiography. I <laughs> love that. This world of misery that is created by selfishness, but this world of lies and propaganda and incessant autobiography. I just have to remark on that. It was written so many years ago. But it's like, think about, doesn't that, doesn't that phrase just describe social media to some extent? I know there's good to it, but like incessant autobiography. It's just a self-centered way of living. And what has been described here, this is kind of the devil's sort of territory. So C.S. Lewis goes on to say, and just kind of brace yourself, and he says this, he says, there is indeed something satanic about a person who has no interests other than themselves, because such self-consummation, such narcissism, reflects the truest and deepest boredom of Satan himself which is really heavy, it sounds dramatic, but James chapter 3, selfish ambition is described as earthly, unspiritual, demonic. That's what we're up against when we are up against our selfishness, our self-centered ways. But when we get saved, when we get born again, when we become followers of Jesus, as we receive, listen to me, as we receive Jesus' self-sacrificial love, that love, agape love, self-sacrificial, die on the cross while we were sinners. That love, when you by faith receive that love, by its nature, starts to chisel at self-centeredness and love and concern and interest for self. Which again is why it is only in Christianity that there is a chance of self-sacrificing love being present between people who are not even family. Because we, as Christians, the only people in the world, worship a God who self 
sacrificed. I just want you to think about that because it just occurred to me the other day again just how stunning that is. We worship a God who came down, humbled himself, died. No matter what other religions out there, nobody else gets to say that. We worship a God of self-sacrificing love. And we come into contact with that love. And that love, only that love, can chisel away, break down our selfishness, our self-centeredness. Which is why when you start to grow as a Christian, this becomes the core of what God does in us. As he starts to love us and show us how to love and goes deeper, man, he gets to the core of our selfishness. And that's why you'll find this idea of selfishness just coming up all over the place when it comes to how to live as a Christian. It came up last week in Justin's sermon about carrying each other's burdens. It's there in that one another. How selfishness can torpedo that (laughs) self-centeredness and a high view of yourself. And it comes up in a lot of one another's as well. So in this passage, we came across another two. Let me show you how these other two one another's are built on the same idea of getting rid of self so that we can love one another. So verse 10, love one another with brotherly affection. Right away says then, outdo one another in showing honor. Man, this is my favorite one another statement. Outdo one another in showing honor. Here's why it's my favorite, because it's so ironic. So I'm like, you've come to notice this a little bit, I think. But I'm quite a competitive person. So when I see I do one another, I'm like, oh man, this is it. I get to beat somebody at something in the Bible, right? So I do one another is a competitive kind of phrase. But it's I do one another in showing honor. Right? So like, oh, wait, hang on a second. So in other words, like beat others, be better at others, at making them better. In other words, be first at being second. What? Say that again? Now that's what it's saying. It's this, be better, be the best at making others the best. See how ironic that is? I love that. Be first at putting other people first. Can you imagine? Sometimes I feel like we read the Bible and there just like there's a sentence that if you just take that away and apply it to the whole world, it'd be a better place. Can you just imagine if the whole world just did this? Be first at putting other people first. Which is why there's that joke, by the way, of why there'll be actually no Christians in heaven because we'll all be standing outside the pearly gates and going, no, you first, no, you first. And even we'll just stand outside the gates for eternity. Be first at putting others first first. See, that comes right after love one another with brotherly affection. You've just got to be able to do this. Challenge self-centeredness. Then the other one another statement that comes up in this passage, verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Which sounds like it's just about unity and living together in peace with our diversity and to be sure it is that. But notice the ingredient. How are we able to live in this kind of unity? Well, it says, do not be haughty. So live in harmony with one another. So don't be prideful, but associate with the lowly and don't be wise in your own sight. Which goes back to last week. Again, self-centeredness, torpedoes, any chance at living in harmony torpedoes any chance of showing one another on and therefore it's not possible to love so just as I kind of finish off here hopefully convinced of how central this idea I'm sure you knew that already right but of how central this idea of loving one another is but like what's at stake the journey that's involved here what do we do obviously first I just would love, we would love for you, if you have not experienced this love of Christ, to experience that. To reach out and to pray and experience this love of God. Because without it, it's simply not possible. It's only this love that breaks down our insecurities. 
It's only this love that enables us to be vulnerable. It's only this love that destroys our self-centeredness. Second, to realize, man, it's a bit of a journey here. I love 1 Thessalonians 4, it's 9 to 10. It says, now about brotherly love, we don't need to write to you, Paul says. You guys are doing this, brotherly love. You got this. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. See, God teaches us to love each other. And he's saying to the Thessalonian church, you got this. You guys are doing this. You're doing it to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. You're the best at loving. But then he says, yet we urge you, do so more and more. Everybody listening, we're all learning to love. And I mean, last, just really simple, is to be praying for this. It's amazing, Scripture, how often there are these prayers to help us love each other. So guys, let's, let's do this. And this kind of eve of moving to coming back together. I think it's appropriate that we pause here before we start to exercise these beautiful one another's to get this right. Starts by praying and receiving the love that Jesus Christ has for you. So let's pray. God, I do pray this morning that simply this idea of your perfect, unconditional love for us. I pray that it would seep into the hearts of, of those listening, all of us, all of us. And especially for those who've never experienced, who've never known that they are fully and completely loved. Our Holy Spirit, we pray that you would Impress that. Insert that deep in the hearts of those listening. And we pray, God, that you would enable us to love more and more and more. Continue to reduce our insecurities. Build this platform of security that we have in you that enables us to be vulnerable and to love. Continue to challenge our selfishness with your self-sacrificial love. Continue to bind us together like a family. Even though we don't know Everybody in this family, we haven't been able to meet even this last few months, but Lord, by your Spirit, be drawing us together. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you didn't hear when we started the service, uh, we have a, a great video that we want to show you about next Sunday and about this journey of being better together and coming back together. So watch with us. And then church, I want to remind you about the most exciting announcement I have for us. And that is that we are coming back together on the 18th of October to have in-person live worship, live preaching in the auditorium. It's as close to normal church as it was back on the 15th of March, the last time we gathered.
morning. Hello. Church family, welcome home. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Hey, I'm just so amazed. It's the first time I've seen that just right now. And uh, this is really making me looking forward to next week so much. So I want to leave you with these words just about... Yeah, about next week. And as you know, and for those who aren't able to come, uh, we're surely going to be just trusting God to still be meeting with you online. We're going to be doing our best to create just a meaningful online service for you. Uh, but I've just, you know, been thinking about this idea of how coming back to church for so many people um, is going to be a step out of the comfort zone again. Um, you know, that beginning of that kind of game sort of metaphor in that in that video is kind of choose your outfits. It's been so nice, church at home, I would imagine, to kind of, you know, just watch church in your PJs. You don't have to get ready and shower and go through all of that. You can have breakfast while you're watching church, uh, do your toenails, I don't know, whatever it is you do. And, and now coming to church, like it's a step out of, you know, your comfort zone for that. And for us as well, like this studio has been a really comfortable space for us. We've come to love it as awkward as this camera is. Uh, so it's a step out of our comfort zones. And yet there is a great gift in this. And uh, I just read this in Romans, just chapter one, just right in the beginning, um, but verse 11. So Paul says he's writing to the church. So he's communicating with them. So that was the technology they had. So it's like this, but I mean, he's writing to them. He's talking to them, but he still says this. For I long to see you. I'm longing to see you. I'm writing to you. I'm communicating to you, but I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. See what he's saying there? There's a gift. I know we kind of come back to church that there'll be a gift to you in being present. But think about, in the context of today's sermon, the gift that you will be to other people. Mutually strengthening and imparting a gift to each other as we start to see each other again on this long, slow journey back to some kind of normal. We love you, church family. Look forward to meeting you either in person or in line in the next coming weeks. Bye-bye and have a great Sunday.